You are listening to A Difference for One podcast, episode number 27. I'm Michelle. I'm Nicole. I'm Sharice. And I'm Cami. We are the English Sisters. We come together to share life-changing methods of improvement through a variety of topics. We hope that above all, these discussions will help you feel that Jesus Christ is making a difference for you, the one. And we also hope that our podcast will inspire you to find simple ways that you can make a difference for one. Hi, everyone. It's Michelle. And today I'm doing an interview with a friend of mine, Ryan Nichols, on emergency preparedness. September is preparedness month. And as we often hear, if we are prepared, we have no need to fear. I recently read the scripture in Matthew 5 that talks about letting your light shine to give light unto all that are in the house. And I believe the light we shine is not only an example to others, but a protection. We can protect all around us as we prepare spiritually and physically for whatever may come our way. That doesn't mean we're exempt from the effects of anything that can happen, but better able to make it through any hard times. This interview recording is a little glitchy in parts, so I apologize for that ahead of time, but I think you'll really enjoy the message and practical tips. So here we go. We'll be back after this quick break with a message from our sponsors. Hello, everyone. I am so excited about the episode today because I am interviewing Ryan Nichols, and we are going to talk about personal preparedness. I asked him to join us because I recently felt a rejuvenated need to build up our food storage and work on our emergency preparedness items, partly because of the pandemic and seeing the shelves go bare so quickly several months ago, and partly because it's just been something gnawing in the back of my head saying, this is important, and even though it doesn't have a due date, you need to get this done. And so my husband and I decided this summer that we were going to really dive in and start working on it. And during the pandemic and when those shelves went bare, we didn't feel like we needed to rush out and get a ton of food because we had enough for that. But it just opened our eyes to wanting to be prepared and wanting to set a little bit aside every time we go to the store so that we can be stocked up in case there is another emergency that comes our way that is more traumatic, perhaps. And so... What we did this past summer is we bought a bunch of five-gallon buckets and Mylar bags and oxygen absorbers and got some staples like wheat, rice, beans, sugar, things like that, put them in these five-gallon buckets and labeled them, and that's where we have started. And then we also got some barrels that we put in our garage for water. And I'm ashamed to admit that they sat empty in our garage for a couple of years before we finally pushed ourselves to clean them out and fill them up, and now they're ready to go. And so um, this has just been something that's been on my mind a lot lately, so I wanted to invite Ryan to join us and talk about his experience and why he is more of an expert than I am, because I am just scratching the surface on my knowledge on this. So Ryan, do you want to go ahead and Introduce yourself and tell us your education background and what you do for a living, what your experience is in this area. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Uh, My name is Ryan Nichols. Um, My full-time job is emergency management. I've served in the emergency management position uh, now going on for about 15 years. Uh, Prior to coming to St. Louis, I served as a local city county emergency management director uh, for about a decade. I served at the state level. Uh, I've been on uh, several federal deployments at different disasters. I've served on a, as a team leader for an incident, uh, incident support team where we go out and, and respond to disasters. And so I've been on many response efforts following large-scale disasters. And then um, on a personal level, I, uh, my wife and I enjoy practicing preparedness and, and some food storage principles. And so We've put that into practice during our 20 plus years of marriage. And so between the two, um, we practice it. We try to improve on it. There's always lots to learn. And uh, we feel like there have been a lot of lessons learned, not only from my deployments, but uh, just watching. It doesn't take a deployment to really watch what's going on and some of the challenges that others that are impacted have. And so we try to learn from those and, and apply them and, and make sure that we always have enough for, for us and our family. And so that's a little bit about me. 
Great. And is this something that you knew you wanted to do like fresh out of college and what kind of education did you have to get to get into this? No, uh, actually my previous life before emergency management, I, I was in healthcare. I worked as a registered nurse in a trauma mm -hmm. unit and uh, I completed my bachelor's and Hurricane Katrina, well actually prior to Hurricane Katrina, there were several incidents going on across the country and so I pursued my graduate degree in emergency management and I got a master's out of Oklahoma in emergency management and then uh, started my, my first major deployment was Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and I finished up my degree about the same time I finished up that deployment and I've been doing it full time ever since that time. So yeah, it wasn't at first, but it was just uh, a few uh, cascading events that kind of came together and led me to it academically. And then I uh, got a few other job opportunities or experiences and it all kind of came together. Awesome. That's really cool. I love to see how God works in our lives, you know, where it's not exactly the plan that you had, but he has a better plan for you. And as you just follow those steps, he, he sees oh, you. Oh, really. works out. Yeah, when I told my wife I wanted to do emergency management, her first question was, what is that? And I, my answer was, I'm not sure, but it looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out together, I guess. We'll find out together. <laughs> so why do you feel like it's so important to be prepared as an individual family for emergencies? You know, because as parents, as sons and daughters, as brothers and sisters, no one likes to see suffering, you know, and disasters are just that, they're disasters, they're, go they're gonna hurt. But without a doubt, those that are prepared, those that not only prepare, but we talk a lot about mitigation, those that can mitigate or minimize what might happen. And then when it's something does have just the basic resources to get by those first few moments or hours or days, really makes things uh, much more tolerable. There's a lot less fear, a lot less concern to have uh, when there's a risk coming, when you are prepared, when the light, you, you know, it didn't have to be a big disaster. You know, something simple as when the power goes out. I mean, uh, about a couple months ago, our power went out for about 36 hours here at the house. Wow. And we have a couple of freezers and refrigerators, but, you know, we, we weren't worried. We, we had all things in place. Our junior that we, that we maintained was fine and everything came together and you just don't have to worry about it doesn't take a big thing to use preparedness principles it doesn't take a hurricane to use it and so it could be a power outage a house fire or a tornado preparedness everybody at some point someone's going to need preparedness in their life some preparedness capabilities or response and it's just better to do it ahead of time because it saves lives it saves pain it saves time it saves money there's so much insurance investment into it. I just think there's a lot of value to it. And not only in my own life, I mean, I've never had a major in my own home, but um, being with those that have, uh, it just, it really works. Okay. So um, you consider this as important as having a life insurance policy or homeowner's without insurance? A without a doubt. Without a doubt. When I, um, I was uh, I was in Joplin about two hours after the tornado went and through and stayed there for about two weeks, and the devastation was 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 overwhelming. And one of the common phrases that we heard in the case management that was referenced to us was they just everyone some of the residents many of them just never thought it would happen to them. That was a common mm -hmm. we never thought it would happen to us. Mm -hmm. Just. That's just something I don't want to come home and and not have had done the best I could to minimize my kids or my wife from having to suffer because I was negligent in some really simple, easy, basic preparedness practices. Yeah. I have a friend from the Joplin area who has, they've lost their home, I can't remember, two or three times, and they just have had to keep rebuilding. Okay. It's been pretty, it was pretty devastating for them, I'm sure. Um, what other kinds of things have you seen um, as you've gone into these, like the aftermath of, of these big devastating? The events? aftermath is, is devastating and, you know, and we can see even the wildfires now as I, as I watch those responses, you know, like in Oregon last week, I think statewide they had up to 500,000 people that were evacuated under some level of evacuation and some of them immediately. I, I have a very close friend in Oregon that was 
the last week because he was trapped in his house surrounded by wildfires. Oh, wow. you know, these things happen, but outside of that, sometimes we feel like, or sometimes the image I, I, I'm told is, well, there's enough stuff out there, there's enough responders, there's enough help that help will come. And that's not true. I mean, help does eventually come, but it doesn't come in the time when you need it right away. And so you can't pass the buck for personal preparedness. And then even those immediate needs, even if those are met, there's things that only you can do. As you mentioned earlier, similar to insurance, you know, there's only things you can do to protect your, your documents, your, your finances, those important things in your home that can, can never be rebuilt or recovered. And so much is electronic and a lot of that is preparedness in the electronic world and the redundancies that are required. Only you can do that outside of those immediate life, threatening life safety skills, mm -hmm. things from a preparedness perspective that will just make your life easier if you invest a little time beforehand to kind of get things organized. Yeah, even protecting those family photos, those precious family memories, if you right. digitalize them. Um, I remember I was on, on bed rest in the hospital with one of my sons several years ago and I was like, honey, bring me all the discs and all of the things. If I'm on bed rest, I might as well be productive and, and have a digital copy, you know, on Google photos of every photo we have. And um, yeah, just you find the time to do it at some point, you know. And Hurricane Katrina, now that was 15 years ago, but it was so devastating that, uh, and they lost completely everything that there was no proof that you owned your property and there was no proof where your property was. Mm -hmm. And um, starting at the courthouse steps at the very beginning, there was down to surveyors and markers and trying to figure out because there was nothing in writing, nothing to show that uh, what was there was yours. And so, so much of that can be, so much of that headache can be avoided uh, ahead of time. Yeah, and um, they had, Katrina was a perfect example of how long it did take for them to be able to come in and rescue. It wasn't immediate and right away. And they had to, you know, and, and there were a lot of people that were super upset about why aren't they coming in and taking care of us? And, but you should have evacuated. And there are some things that you need to do to be prepared until they can get there. And, and you know, that's a whole nother story, but FEMA, I stand by them. FEMA is not a, they're not a response agency. And I have my plenty of frustration with them, but that, that's what they were never designed to be that way. And, and really it's, it's, it's shame on us if we're gonna put our preparedness on the responsibility of somebody else. Yeah. We, we, need, we need to be, I, I've really, I really hold on to them. We need to be self-reliant. We need to be self-reliant before, during and after disaster. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so what would you say to someone who is first starting out? They they hear this podcast and they're like, "Okay, I'm going to I'm going to try to get some things together. I'm going to start this journey. Where would you direct them and how would you have them start?" Uh, the first thing I would do or suggest is don't get overwhelmed, don't stress about it. This is simple. This is really easy. There are a lot of good resources out there, a lot of good suggestions. Those ideas and best practices, they'll come uh, as you need to find them. But really, there's a couple of, of good places to start. But before I'd even go research, um, one of the lessons I learned when my wife and I, when we first married, our first goal was we started in the food storage right away. And we were doing legumes and beans and things I couldn't pronounce. I, I <laughs> minute I'm supposed to store them, so I'm buying them, I'm storing them. And uh, a wise member of the ward said, you know what? You can store that, but it doesn't do any good if you and your kids aren't going to eat it. Mm -hmm. And she asked, would your kids eat that? I'm like, probably not. I don't know if I would, but I guess I'll wait till they're completely starving to death and then maybe they'll, they'll want to eat it. And she goes, well, maybe you could store something that you don't have to wait till they're that hungry to want to eat something. And so we reevaluated what we store, what we started to store. You know, wheat can do a lot of things with wheat. Rice, you can do a lot of things with the right wheat. We stored sugar. We stored hard candy. Uh, anything that we could really sweeten things up, you know, and we did the beans, we did the rice, we did all those things, but we really focused on storing what are the things that we will eat mm -hmm. and those suggestions won't storage well. Yeah, I can pick some ideas from that, but what will we eat? And then 
not only is it the Mylar bags like you described, but it's really, it's going to Aldi's. Uh, we're Aldi's fans and it's buying cans that you normally eat. And instead of buying two, you buy four. Instead of buying four, you buy eight. You know, just buy a little bit more. One of the best things, the phrases we always say is, is preparedness is not a, a it's not a one-time project. It's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and is there a way, is there a place in your food pantry or in the corner in your basement or somewhere to where you store your food? Can you add a little depth and maybe, maybe not double it, but maybe add, maybe add 30%, 50% to what you have and, and build that over time and build things and add to things you're already eating, just add volume to that. And can you cook it? And can you, can you clean it? Can you cook it? And in various conditions. And, and then time will come as you think, if you sit down and think about it, you know, we lose our power for 48 hours. Will we be able to stay warm? We'll be able to eat. And so thinking through those things, what I would do first is sit down and think about those things in, in these situations and don't, and don't come up with an Armageddon situation. The world's over. How are we going to survive? No, just something simple and basic. You know, we lose power or, you know, maybe a big storm came through and some damage was done, or maybe we're trapped in our subdivision for a few days, whatever. How will we just kind of get by? Maybe our kids are at school and something happens and now we can't communicate. How do we get a hold of them? And so some of those things, you just sit down and think through them. And then when you reach out to find information, you'll be able to connect with what you feel is applicable to you. Don't let information guide what you need to do. You, you kind of set the foundation. What does my lifestyle need to be like in, in a crisis? Now, we're not trying to live the Hilton here. I mean, we're not. We don't live three full square meals a day. I mean, if you can get by with a couple of meals a day, that's fine. Right. Go find that. And there's really good websites that I can reference. The two I highly recommend is Provident Living and Red Cross. Those are probably the two most consistent, solid, most experienced organizations that have uh, both uh, preparedness and food storage tips to kind of get things. But when you read that, you'll be able to apply what does, how does that, what does that mean for my family? rather than you trying to adapt your food stores to some other family that doesn't really work for you. I really love that advice because I think I spun my wills for years on Pinterest, <laughs> like pinning every per like emergency preparedness related thing and being like, okay, well, where do I, you know, I got so overwhelmed and you've got your heat sources and your, you know, all of these different things. And it was really overwhelming. And I would just think, okay, the first thing I need to do is figure out a plan. And I would get stuck in the planning mode and never just take steps, you know, just buying flashlights and batteries at the store when I'm there um, or candles or, you know, whatever is a much more efficient step than just going through Pinterest, trying to pin everything that applies to right. emergency preparedness. So I love that advice. So we... Uh, Ryan and I are both members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they do have a basic plan for what kinds of food storage things that they recommend and um, some emergency preparedness tips. What are your thoughts on what the church recommends? And do, you, like, do you feel like it's sufficient what they recommend, or do you feel like there's a lot that you would add to it? It, it, is, it is sufficient. I mean, they're covering a lot of Tory law different uh, people and populations that they're trying to get it's to. It's worldwide. It's worldwide, obviously. And, and a lot of their resources, you know, um, I, my wife and I were talking about it the other day, you know, like at the Bishop's Storehouse, you know, they have the food storage site, and it's really just large bulks anymore. And those things work for the buckets, like you were describing earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's, it's, it's not, it's not a hundred percent. To me, I think it's a balance. It's getting some of their bulk items but also I think it's adding up some, storing up some cans from Aldi's or Walmart or whatever and adding to that. And it's having some of those bases, it's having a little bit of extra. And water storage is hard, you know, space-wise and, and longevity. I mean, it stores, I mean, it's just water, but you know, maybe step one would be just have some water purification options. Mm -hmm. and, and so maybe you have water supply, but maybe protecting yourself from having unclean water to make sure it's potable. And then, work on your supply of water. And so, I mean, and the church not only provides the food sort of that, but they have a lot of, a lot of really good information and, and uh, ideas and advice on how to kind of put some of that together. But outside of, you know, of food and water, you know, you really need to also think of 
the communication to make sure you can always have heat communication. A lot of, a lot of uh, folks are dependent on electricity for medical reasons, pharmaceutical needs. Um, for like a, a pair of eyeglasses or eye glasses, extra contacts or, or, or insulin, you uh -huh. know, or, you know, um, I had a pharmacist tell me that, you know, usually your monthly pills or your monthly medications are on a 28 day cycle. And so if you pick them up every day on that 28th day, usually the month is 30 or 31, you can over, um, over several months, start picking up a few extra, extra. few extra days of medicine over time. And that was his advice was hit it right on the mark and you can pick up a little bit of extra for those life savings. Now you can't go long term. Maybe it's difficult to store, and, and I'm not a pharmaceutical ex expert, but there's little things like that to make sure that outside of beans and rice and water, you need to make sure that uh, if you can't communicate with your kids, if cell phone towers go down and, and all the family is not you at home. You have a meeting place. And you have meeting places to go to and to connect to, to find them. You know, we talked, we mentioned important documents is, you know, even simple things about getting out of the house during emergencies or protecting the home or sheltering in place when or doing when a fire drill, fire drill, especially for younger kids, that's critically important. A Red Cross will tell you story after story of kids that when they get scared in a fire or something and there's a lot of confusion, they go hide under the bed. <laughs> They go on high, they go to their safe place, mm -hmm. you know, and, and unfortunately they're found there afterwards, not, not alive. I mean, it's just, it's sad because they, they didn't know what to do and they, they went to go hide to find security, security what they, and, and then they can't be found and it's too late. And so, you know, it's things like that, that really matter the most that afterwards you're just, you could, you could have prevented it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's really Good advice. It's a lot, a lot to think about and a lot to, like, I just had the idea if we think of one thing a week that are, you know, even like on family nights, like let's do a fire drill this family night and maybe next family night we'll talk about a meeting place near the home or away from the home or, you know, just like one thing that if you just kind of calendar it in, you'll remember to take it a little bit at a time so it's not so overwhelming. So there is a great, I'll provide another resource. This has been around for about a decade. Uh, do one thing.com. Okay. Do, do, and then the number one and then thing.com. And what that is, is um, they have a 12 month preparedness program calendar. And every month they'll tell you what you need to do this month. One might focus on redundant electricity. One might focus on fire safety. One might focus on water or food and, and they give you tips and everything. And so if there's do one thing.com can help you kind of get caught up with keeping a regular small little things every month of what to do. Cool. That's a, that's a great tip. I'm going to for sure check that out. That really helps to spread it out over time and not make it so overwhelming. Do you have other books or podcasts, websites that you recommend that, that have really helped your family or that you uh, ready.gov comes from FEMA. I mean, it's fairly generic, but they do have a lot of really good tips and it can kind of give you an idea of what you should probably consider preparing for in your area. Most people know, but there may be some nuances you're not familiar with. So the top three I always look to is FEMA, ready.gov, the American Red Cross, and then Provident Living. The do one thing is a really good um, one that kind of teach you where to go or what to do on, on a regular basis. And then just sitting down and, and talking through it and, and learning it. There's a lot of information out there, but just not to get overwhelmed, just make it a lifestyle and, and be very planful and methodical about it. And it really will come together slowly, but surely. Cool. Thanks. Any other tips you want to add in there before I wrap it up with a little spiritual message? You know, no, I think you covered it really, really well. My advice again would be, there is the, the food and the water, the shelter a little bit, but really how, how do you, how do we get by in a power outage? How do we get by in simple things when we have food and water? There's other things to consider. So look outside the box to those immediate life safety needs, even though those are critically important. There are a lot of other things. Um, even in my family, we have secret word and my kids are very uh, schooled or educated to know when mom or dad say the secret word, there's something really wrong and kids just need to follow directions without question. 
and we could use that secret word when we're out in public, maybe we're in a store, maybe we're somewhere there's something mom and dad picked up on that's just not right and we need to get out or change or do something different. And, and just a high, we feel like there's a risk perception much higher than one one. And we've never had to use advice take, given to me by some law enforcement friends that we've always held close to us to make sure that we know that our kids know that we talk about this and, and they know what to do should something happen. That's great advice. I love that. We have a code word as well, but we haven't talked about it in a long time. So I guess it's important to keep bringing it up and be like, okay, do you guys know what the code word is and when we're going to use it? And we don't talk, you know, we don't just throw it out there whenever it's, it's, it's important. So yeah, I love that. So I just kind of wanted to tie it in with um, some scripture that I have read recently that seems to go along with this really well. Um, I know that some of our listeners are not members of the church, so they're not familiar with the Book of Mormon as, as much as we are, but I think that they'll still be able to gain some some insights from from this story from the Book of Mormon. So we were reading a couple of weeks ago as a family this story about um, some Gadianton robbers who live out in the wilderness, and the Nephites are the regular citizens in society at that time. And the leader of the Gadianton robbers um, sends a letter to the chief judge of the Nephites and says, we are coming to destroy you unless you align with us and follow our ways and join with us. We are going to take over and just destroy everything. And so they decided instead of giving up their religion and their freedoms that they were going to all band together and unite and they took all of their provisions and all went to a concentrated area and had enough provisions to live off of for seven years. And the Gadian robbers came in and tried to surround them. And they're like, oh, we'll just choke them out. We'll cut them off from any sort of outside resources and we'll be able to, they'll, they'll give up eventually. But they didn't realize that they had these provisions and the Gadian robbers were used to robbing and stealing to get their, what they needed or to kill animals in the wilderness. And so without those resources, they were the ones that were starving and hungry. And so as I thought about this with my family and, and with, uh, talking to my kids, I was like, you know, those faithful followers of God knew that they needed to, to be prepared for the future. They had enough food, not only for the next few months, but for several years. And as they pulled those resources together, they had what they needed. And I love the beautiful message of that and how as we seek to be a God-fearing people, it's often those people that are the ones that are more prepared, that are thinking of the future and the, and the different things that could happen to us and are seeing the value in having finances for a rainy day saved aside and having enough food if you, like you said, if there's a power outage or, you know, or some sort of emergency. I see a connection, like a spiritual and temporal connection between the two that oftentimes they come together. Do you have any thoughts about that to kind of wrap this up? Yes, uh, I think I love that story and uh, I enjoyed reading it again recently too. There's an underlying principle I think that's laced inside of all that and you referenced it there at the end is, is the principle that the church teaches is, is very much self-reliance and preparedness is self-reliance. You can be self-reliance no matter what circumstance you're in. No matter if it's before, during, or after a disaster, you're self-reliant. And, and I personally love the thought of being self-reliant for everything happens i don't have to worry about taking care of myself or my family i can go help and take care of other people because i have all things in in, in the, and so you know as president Udorf, uh, one of the church leaders once said is uh spiritual and temporal self-reliance they're they're the same they're two sides of the same coin you know you can have one without the other and so in your story as they as they looked as a as a they became both spiritual and temporally self-reliant and were able to hold off for those seven years while they why the Gideon robbers uh, were unable to 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 meet their desires of conquering, and so uh, I think it's very very closely tied together. Yeah, I love that that our church leaders have been talking a lot about the need for both that spiritual and temporal self reliance, and how it makes all the difference being able to provide for your family in all of those ways, and that all aspects, you know, like that spiritual and the temporal, should constantly be worked on 
as a family. And I feel like as you work on those things together, you're going to see the strength and the unity that comes as a family working together on those things. Very much so. We agree. I just want to end by saying that I really believe that um, God will bless us in our efforts to seek to have this kind of preparedness for our families and that he really can direct us as we seek um, his guidance. He can direct us on what is important to focus on in the moment and then take those steps and be prepared for the little things or the big things that, that come along. Is there anything you want to add to at the end here? No, thank you so much for the time and uh, would encourage simple, would encourage steady, um, make it a lifestyle and you, there will be great benefits that come from it. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and um, we will see you all on our next episode. Thank Take you. Care. Thanks. Bye. If you like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. If it resonates with you, the greatest compliment you could give is to share it with a friend who might benefit from it as well. Check out A Difference for One on Instagram for additional content. And if you have any questions, comments, a topic you'd like to hear about, or if you'd be interested in a free mini coaching session, send an email to a difference for one at gmail.com.